Those sources provide us with incredibly rich amounts of information. When you think about it for a moment though, that knowledge won't get us very far for one simple but easily overlooked reason. That knowledge is impermanent and fleeting. Consider the knowledge that sense perception affords us, for example. In order to make use of that knowledge, we have to be able to call it to mind again when it becomes relevant. It's not enough for me to perceive that the flakes that burn my tongue are bright red. I have to be able to recall that information in the future. For instance, the next time I consider whether I want to sprinkle some of those red flakes on my food. What I need then is memory. In fact, our faculty of memory is so central to our knowledge that if you look at psychology textbooks on the topic of learning, virtually all of the material in those books is devoted to questions regarding memory. Given the importance of memory for knowledge, it's probably not surprising to you by now to hear that philosophers have had a number of things to say about the topic. Some of the philosophical theories are specific to the topic of memory, while others are more related to the sorts of questions that have occupied us across a number of these lectures, like how the faculty of memory might relate to more general questions about the structure of knowledge. So what we'll do over the course of this lecture and the next is tackle both of these types of questions. In this lecture, we'll look at questions raised by the topic of memory specifically. Those include questions about what the objects of memories are. Are they stored experiences in the mind, or are they the past events themselves? The questions also include whether memory merely preserves beliefs and knowledge that you've already acquired, or whether you can ever gain new knowledge on the basis of memory. After we deal with some of the problems specific to the topic of memory, in the next lecture we'll step back and see how the discussion of memory relates to the larger questions we've considered so far. Is the best account of how memory supports knowledge a foundationalist one or a coherentist one? Does internalism do a better job of explaining memory knowledge, or do we need to appeal to externalism in order to explain knowledge on the basis of memory? Those are the sorts of questions that we'll look at in the next lecture. Before we discuss questions concerning memory, however, it will help us to distinguish between different types of memory. First, we can distinguish between long-term, short-term, and working memory. When psychologists talk about short-term memory, they mean really short. Short-term memory stores small pieces of information for no more than a few seconds or so. And though psychologists nowadays generally distinguish the concept of working memory from that of short-term memory, those differences don't really concern us here. The very brief summary of the reason for distinguishing between them is that short-term memory was initially thought to be a single, undifferentiated short-term information storage mechanism, whereas theories of working memory generally involve more specialized types of short-term storage for accomplishing different cognitive tasks. What matters for us is that working memory, like short-term memory, also has to do with storing information for very short periods of time to aid with both reasoning and action. Working memory is sometimes referred to as a buffer, an analogy to the temporary storage of data on your computer when it's moving that information from one place to another. The sort of memory that philosophers are generally interested in, however, is the kind involved when you remember that chili pepper flakes are spicy or that Washington crossed the Delaware in December 1776. When philosophers talk about memory, they're concerned primarily with long-term memory. We can distinguish between three different types of long-term memory, roughly based on the type of information stored. Psychologists refer to these types of memory as procedural, semantic or declarative, and episodic. Let's take a few moments to describe each of these types. Procedural memory supports the ability to perform skilled actions. So for example, if you know how to play a certain musical piece on the piano, or you know how to tie a bow tie, those skills rely on procedural memory. Semantic or declarative memory involves the memory of events in terms of their descriptions. You can think of semantic memory as like an entry in a notebook or a diary. Both of the terms used to describe this type of memory, semantic and declarative, indicate that this memory involves information stored with the aid of language. The last type of long-term memory, episodic memory, involves the memory of experiences. If semantic memory is like a diary entry, episodic memory is more like a home movie. These memories aren't stored with the aid of language. As the comparison to a home movie suggests, these memories are what allows us to replay previous experiences at a later time. Interestingly, the three types of long-term memory seem to be distinct, in that you can have one type without having either of the other two. So, for example, I just said that episodic memories are what allow us to replay previous experiences at a later time. When I said us, however, I was speaking rhetorically, because I myself have pretty much no episodic memories. There is a phenomenon in cognitive psychology that has only recently been named, called aphantasia. People with aphantasia have little or no ability to form or manipulate mental images. No vivid imaginations, no daydreams, nothing. One of the phenomena often associated with aphantasia is called severely deficient autobiographical memory. It's basically a lack of episodic memory capacity. It's pretty easy to see the connection between aphantasia and a lack of episodic memories. Episodic memories involve the use of vivid mental images. For that reason, an inability to form such mental images would certainly seem to be related to problems in recalling episodic memories. Now, these two phenomena, aphantasia and severely deficient autobiographical memory, are very close to me since I have both of them. I have virtually no ability to form mental images, and I also have no episodic memories. All of my memories about myself, who my wife is, who my children are, when and where I got married, who attended the ceremony, everything, 